Did you know that God likes a good party? In fact, celebrating with family and friends was actually seen as an act of worship in the Old Testament. God commanded the Jewish people to celebrate and remember the good things that God had done for them with times of feasting and fellowship. And then there was Jesus. Jesus enjoyed celebrations. And his first miracle was turning water into fine wine at a wedding feast. There's lots of stories of Jesus that involve shared meals, as it was common in that time to show hospitality to people. And life and community was centered around fellowship meals. There was a lot of aspects of church life at Brook Hill Church that I miss dearly. It's been really hard during this pandemic, especially the times of feasting and celebration, our potluck dinners, our traditional Thanksgiving church meal, and most of all, Holy Communion, a feast that Jesus introduced to us where we remember God's great love for us all. The point of our parable today is that God, the host, invites us all to be the guest at the celebration called life. But we are also called to be the servants that are called to go out to invite the world to God's love. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, how grateful we are to be invited into the celebration of your love and the life you gift us with. Give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to the invitation you offer us all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now Jesus often found himself in the middle of a party or meal. Jesus even got in trouble with the Jewish leaders who accused Jesus of being a drunk and a glutton because he partied with tax collectors and sinners. However, in our story today, Jesus has been invited to the home of a prominent Pharisee, a religious leader, to celebrate the Sabbath meal with this man and his friends. The text says that they were watching him carefully probably looking for a cause to accuse him. And Jesus immediately ticks them off by healing a person on the Sabbath, a big no-no to these leaders. He also points out how the guests were fighting to sit in the best seats at the table and how maybe that was the wrong attitude. At this point, the listeners are probably irked at Jesus or just maybe he had them thinking in a new way. Isn't that just like Jesus? When we need scripture and it makes us a little, when we read scripture and it makes us a little uncomfortable, we can either dismiss it and ignore the truth we're hearing, or we can open our hearts to really hear and change our way of thinking to go aligned up with God's ways. Today, I challenge us all to listen with an open heart for God speaking to us and to not dismiss and tune out the truth that we might need to hear, even if it is uncomfortable. So there seems to be this uneasy silence after Jesus speaks. And then one of the guests remarks, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. It's kind of like, okay, let's change the subject, Jesus. However, Jesus uses this comment, to tell them a parable about the kingdom of God. So here's the background on this parable. In the first century, someone throwing a feast would send out invitations for an RSVP. And when the meal was ready, the host would send a servant around to collect the guest and bring them in. It would be considered very rude to turn down the invitation after the meal had been prepared. So what is that like today? People plan an event, birthday event, wedding. Especially nowadays, we might get that invitation online or maybe the old-fashioned way in the mail. We are expected to respond, make a commitment to going or not going. And if that changes, we should inform the host. In our story today, the invited guests have said they, are, they were going, but then... When the servant goes out and says, dinner's ready, come on over, they back out. And the excuses now represent a sudden last-minute change in plans. And their behavior then, as now, would be considered rude, an insult 
to the host. And in that culture, it was a terrible thing to bring shame on the host. So what is Jesus trying to tell them? How is this like the kingdom of God? So God is the host, the one that does the inviting to life as a disciple. And then God pursues us. Did you know that? God loves each of us and wants a love relationship with us that is real and personal. God invites us through the words in the Bible, through other people, through the circumstances of our lives that draw us to God. In Revelation 3.20 it says, Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus knocks on the door of our life. And our response says a lot about our choices and our priorities. In the parable, let's look at these excuses of those who refuse to attend. I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Or, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Or, I just got married so I can't come. None of these excuses were real reasons they couldn't come. They just didn't want to go. They were focused on things they wanted to do or to get done and not thinking about the host who had gone to all that trouble of preparing the banquet for those that he invited. An excuse is a seemingly polite way of rejection. What about us? When God invites us to be or to do something, and we say, yes, God, but then we have second thoughts. I know I said I would teach that Bible study or help that neighbor or show up at church 10 minutes early to greet guests, but honestly, I need to get the yard work done or I'd rather sleep in or maybe I'm just not good at this. Is our response to God, our excuse, based on what we want to do or not do? Is it about us? Or do we even think about how our not going affects God? Our excuses are based on our priorities, and we may choose lesser things, not what really matters in life. Our excuses maybe are based on fears. I don't want to go to that party. I mean, I might not like the food, or what if the people there are people I don't like? Or our excuses may be based on false assumptions. Oh, it's going to be boring there. Or if I go, God will just be angry because I won't, something I'll do wrong. Or maybe I'm not really good enough to go to God's party. So in Facebook, when you get a, an invitation to an event, there is these three things you can click. There's going, not going, choices. But then there's this other choice called interested. It's the box that you can check. Um, and I'm fascinated with this group, the interested group. Does this mean that they are thinking, I would like to go, but I can't commit? Or I don't want to go, but I don't want to hurt your feelings, so I'll say I'm interested even when I'm not. Or I'm waiting for a better offer. I might go if nothing better comes along. And then there's a lot of Christians like that that kind of check interested to God's invitation. Oh, it kind of sounds good. And when it's time for them to respond, they don't show up. But they feel it's okay, like they didn't outright reject God's invitation, but they did. In this parable, there is not an interested box to check. They have said, yes, they're going, but then when the time comes, they have changed their mind, and they're not going. So what does the host in the story do? He could have canceled the party, but instead, he sends out his servants to go out into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. These are the people that usually are not invited, yet they are welcome at God's table. And there is still more room. Then the master tells the servant to go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. These are the travelers who don't even know there's a party going on. They are invited as well. The idea is that the master, the host, wants the house full. God so loved the world, the messy, broken world. Jesus came into a world to invite all, 
to come into God's love and into abundant life. For those who check going, how exciting to experience the joy of a relationship with God. And for those guests who didn't think they were good enough or important enough or even deserved to attend, how amazing to know that they are included because of God's amazing grace. It says in the Song of Solomon, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me is love. My first year as a teacher, I taught ninth grade English um, in a homeroom time in a small private school. There were only 10 girls in the class, and that year one of the girls announced that her birthday party, her birthday was coming up, and she proceeded to invite all but two girls to the sleepover party at her house. Well, I had a talk with the mother. I said, did you realize that there were two girls not invited to the party? Yes, she said. We don't have room for everyone, so my daughter only invited the ones she liked. I said, did you think about how those girls felt to be rejected? And the mother just looked at me with a blank stare. I remember being very angry about this and made it really clear to the parents that we would have no party invitations given out in class or announced unless all were invited. Jesus is trying to get a point across to these Pharisees. God has prepared a life of celebration and joy. And Jesus has come to tell the world that the banquet is ready. And the Jewish people were invited first, but not so others would be left out. God had a plan for the Jewish people to be a blessing and a light to the world and to point the way to God. And they didn't get it. They thought it was a private party just for them. When Jesus came as the servant of all, even though they checked off going, they refused to follow Jesus. They refused to be the servants that invited others in. As Christians, we can act the same way. We don't want to invite others as we like our safe little group. We don't always want to get along with those that are different, or we may feel like we're not deserving. But Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and so should we, because we were once lost. Now we're found. We were once blind, but now we see. This is the best party in town, is God's party. And we should want to all be a part and invite everyone to God's joy. There are consequences to our excuses and rejection of God's invitation. Many of these Jewish leaders would miss out on what God had prepared. And at the end of the parable, Jesus makes a sharp rebuke to the Pharisees at the table. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. However, this didn't stop God. God extended grace to those outside Israel, to the Gentiles, who weren't a part of the initial request. God continues to invite people, and he calls us to, that if we say yes, we should go out and invite more. Even then, there's still room. So please, bring them in. Who are you in this story? Are you in the first group of invited guests? Are you thinking, I, sh I should be invited? I should um, be on God's VIP list? I mean, I'm good. I'm holy. I'm deserving. Are you like the Jewish leaders, prideful, self-righteous, and ungrateful? Are you like the one on the street? You don't feel like you deserve to come. Maybe you've messed up a lot. And, but God invites you to because God's love and grace is open to even you. We are all broken and outside God's party. The Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet God still loves you and God loves me. And we are invited. What is your response? Last week, Pastor Gary shared a prayer challenge that we are inviting you to join Bless Every Home. It is free. You sign up online with your address, and you can choose how many of your neighbors around you that you want to pray for. You set up a reminder, and it comes to you with their name, and so you can pray for those neighbors. And I challenge everyone that's listening today to sign up, and sign up to at least pray for 10 people that live around you. I challenge you to somehow also let those neighbors know that you're praying for them. I believe if we take that first step, Jesus will begin to knock on the door of their life, and I'm praying for opportunities 
for you and I to share God's love. If you need help, contact me. Wouldn't it be amazing if we covered the city of Frederick with prayer, as there are other churches doing this as well? How might God work through our obedience to pray and share God's love? Go into the streets. Go to the country roads. Go to your neighborhood. Our purpose is to make disciples who make be disciples who make disciples that live and love like Jesus. We are all invited to God's celebration. Please tell God you're going to this event. Don't say you're just interested. Let's celebrate together with God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we all have an invitation to your life that's abundant and meaningful. There's a place at the table for each of us, not because we earned it, but because of your grace that reaches out to each of us. Today, we need to RSVP. Yes, we need to accept your gift of salvation. And for those listening that have already ch who have checked interested, give us the courage to trust you and choose your life over lesser things. And for those of us who are already at the party, God's house is not full. Let us go out and pray and love our neighbors in courageous ways even in a time of social distancing. I pray that your spirit will be poured out on our church so that the world will know that we are your disciples, not by our excuses, not by our pride, but by our love that we share. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who overcame death and invites us to the party that is worth attending. Amen.